Network Automation Nerds podcast. Hello and welcome to Network Automation Nerds podcast, a podcast about network automation, network engineering, Python, and other technology topics. I'm your host, Eric Cho. Today on the show, we continue to have conversation with Taha, aka Net Automator. I have to I have to mention that every single time because it's just so. Excellent. How did you get that handle? Like, somebody must have like offered you to pay you ten thousand dollars. If I have money, I'll, I'll pay for that. But I'm just this plain old Eric Cho. But um. Anyways, um, last week we talked to Tahad about his uh, his journey, his path, how he got into technology, and um, this week I am super excited to continue our conversation and kind of you know we talk about where you know the the tire meets the road, so to speak, right? Like really the meat needy greedy, like how do you uh, what do you find interesting on about containers and all the hotness about Kubernetes and and uh, maybe AI. I don't know. I mean, we're obligated to talk about AI every single time <laughs> to, to boost our ratings, right? But um, yeah. Anyway, Taha, it's great to have you back on the show. Fantastic, Eric. It's it's an absolute pleasure. Pleasure to have. You. Um, thank you so much. It's it's an honor really to be here. Eric. And uh, yeah, I'm 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 very honored. Thank you. Yeah, the the honor is all mine. I mean, I um, we were so excited to talk last. Uh, you know, like the last episode, but in fact, it was just like 30 minutes ago <laughs> we started recording. <laughs> but um, um, it almost got away from us. You know, the reason why I reached out to you previously i mean obviously you're an excellent human being I, I love everything you posted about but what kind of triggered this conversation was a couple of weeks ago you posted about running containers on all three of the i mean not ios per se but yeah. all three of the latest um cisco uh you know uh operating system so ios yeah. xd ios xr and xls yeah. so yeah. tell us a little bit about that yeah, so I one thing I've noticed about, um, and I, I think this is a quite uh, the topic itself. I, I think it lacks quite a lot of resources. Yes, um, yes. And there isn't much resource, and I think one, and I think sometimes it's also mis misunderstood. Um, the one thing I've noticed about network automation is that you know a few years back, you know, it was just network automation, right? It was a particular field. You know, everyone wanted you know wanted to go in. It was a dev net. No, but I think as we sort of dialed forward sort of it, it it's sort of having subdivisions within network automation right mm -hmm. um you know so now you can you know you have guys who are excellent with ai and network automation you know you know who are you have guys who are you know able to do amazing stuff in a multi-vendor environment you have guys the devnet guys then you have you know and then there was, there was a particular field which i thought was not getting enough attention and i think one of the reasons is, is the current role that is sort of pulled me in towards that way um so essentially it's it's unbox programmability or unbox automation right mm -hmm. it's a topic mm -hmm. now it's it's um it's, like i said it's a quite a broad to topic and i think the way it's marketed um especially at cisco maybe isn't quite so helpful to sort of understanding how how much you know what you're able to do with it uh, mm -hmm. for me personally i found it it's such an interesting topic and it's such an amazing topic really um so Essentially, at its core, on-box programmability refers to um, sort of performing automation via the network device itself, as mm -hmm. opposed to do, doing um, an automation deployment from an external sort of box. So when we're doing automation, you know, we're essentially deploying from a laptop or a PC um, that's hooked up somewhere to the network, and we may have Python, and we're essentially deploying that, uh, you know, the script or what, what, what it may be. But... And 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 that, and that is the, sort of the opposite of onbox. Onbox is refers to actually doing the automation within the network itself. So sort of right. think of like an air gapped network, right? That has no access to any PCs, any PC or end, endpoint connectivity that can do automation, um, and and just being able to automate with from the inside of the actual network itself. So one of the nodes will act as an agent and will go ahead and automate the rest as well. Um, that is in its core what onbox programmability is is the ability to perform automation from the inside of your network as opposed to doing a deployment uh, a python deployment or an ansible from an external uh, external node external pc um and, and that is exactly what it is so and i think the way it's marketed by cisco so for example one of the key things that was marketed a few years back was um iox 
right? Yep. Yep. Um, which which is an acronym for um, iOS Linux. Now it was sort of marketed as a application hosting um, um, technology where you're able to act host applications on the edge of the network so within the switch for example right. you're able to run script but I, but i think it wasn't given its due diligence i think there is far more things that that were sort of overlooked that could have been looked at right yeah. um and and um, you know it, it it's 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 a massive massive field it's i mean it's it, 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 it with these, I mean, with this technology, you've got a um, essentially a Linux box. I mean, you are essentially converting your network switch, your data center switch, like a Next Next OS or iOS XE switch. Um, you know, the your ninety Catalyst ninety to three hundreds. You're essentially converting that to a a a, um, a Linux box, right? And and yep. the the sort of uh, it's it's quite endless, really, of what you're able to do. And I think it maybe it wasn't approached from that perspective. It was more approached from the container side. So majority of the questions that I've seen um, that's been come up when I've been posting is the sort of things that come in DMs, like, why? Why would I need to do that? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, what is the point, right? Like, what can you explain to me? Yeah. What, why would I want, want to do that in the first place? Well, it, it has a plenty of, there's, there's, there's plenty of use case for this. And I think I that, that, is, that is one of the, and one of them is is obviously, you know, running python com, you know complex python scripts for example right. or bash script and, and and not just python scripts bash scripts as well yep. that can utilize the underlying net hardware so for example that can be executed by an event manager script uh, perform specific tasks maybe you want to have a look at um maybe you want to see where uh, specific adjacent adjacencies have gone down and then you right. want to ospf and you want and you want them to come back i mean there's so many sort of things that you could do obviously when you've got python in front of you there it's it's it's, it's endless right it's it's, it's, the limit is really down to your creativity. So having running a Python script inside a box is is always helpful, right? It's it's just you know, and I wouldn't obviously recommend running a game on there. Obviously, that's else, right. <laughs> you don't <laughs> want to play Doom on that. I mean, I've seen people do that, right? Like people have played Doom. But, um, you can essentially, but I don't think it's helpful. You know, it's, 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 it's not, not a, a career enhancing movement. <laughs> it might be you know for your own pleasure, but. I, yeah. I totally agree. I mean, I remember, um, well, you know, you, I think you hit on some of the the use cases where, you know, in just in your brief uh, introduction is, I remember the first time I saw it, this wasn't on a Cisco box. This was on an Arista box, actually. But um, there are two uh, two kind of use cases, that main thing that we use it for. Obviously, you, you know more about it, but um, that you mentioned. So the first thing is you're in the, this airtight uh, uh, space, right? Like your data right. center. Right, and yeah. um, you, it's hard for anything to get into that data center. You have to get like, as any big tech would tell you, or any kind of like healthcare, you know, government agency. Yep. It's it requires a lot of approval, right? Like it's, it's a, yeah, it's it's a it's a really daunting process to go. But in this case, you if you have something that's already included in the bundle, that's already approved and you know blessed by the management. Then you have the Swiss Army knife where you could, you know, I mean, it's not going to cut that steak really well, but it will do the job, right? So in this, that, that's the first use case where it's an airtight, air gap environment, a closed loop, and then you already have the SAR Swiss Army knife called Python and Bash and Linux. Absolutely. And the second was, you know, uh, as you talk about like event reaction, right? Like if you have an external management going in, it's never going to be as reactive as fast as something that's on board. Right. Absolutely. And that's that's what exactly what you said. Absolutely. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. I think that that is that is also key. I think one of the other use cases as well, and I think it's sort of overlooked is is running a low latency application and containers yeah. on the edge, you know, and right. I use the term low latency and I use that for a reason. And I'll tell you exactly why, um, mm. you know, um, you know, it's no point, no use, you know, having an application somewhere down in the other side of the world, you know, in a data center, other side of the world, um, where that application is sort of being used by your current sort of building, right? For everyone in your building, it's, it's actually no use having it somewhere in the cloud when it's right. used by a particular sort of, you know, um, um, endpoints within your within your company. Um, it it makes far more sense to have it 
on your edge, right? Because right. Closer to the edge, you get a lot of benefits. Obviously, you'll have low latency. Um, but also, I think one of the when I recently I was speaking to someone, a colleague of mine, about this, and I thought, you know, how interesting that can it be? But then they he he made an interesting point where he said, but you know, maybe that company wants to move to the cloud. That's you know, that's their goal, right? It's to move everything to the cloud. And and I said, you know, and 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 you're, they're essentially coming back to the old method where they're having um, resources sort of you know on prem, which not what they want but you know that is it but but when you but the more you think about that the more you do realize that it is that in the you know when you have when you when you when you move to when a company moves to the cloud usually it's you know from a company that i worked with isn't it's a sort of a from a hybrid standpoint of view i mean you're going to move your resources or you could even move your entire 100 percent resources right you can do a lift and shift and move everything over into the cloud but the issue is i think one thing that people tend to overlook you're still going to have a network infrastructure on prem right i mean you're not <laughs> you're not you're not you're not going to have like you know you, there's not going to be a digital people as my, one of my friends put it that's able to go into the cloud and you know get all that information somewhere and, and you know run the, run those virtual machines whatever it may be that you're doing in the cloud you know you're gonna have you're gonna need a network infrastructure on-prem regardless right um um so you're gonna have a bunch of switches right you're gonna have a bunch of endpoints these are sort of the crucial aspects that things that you're gonna have so one of my thinking was that you know you're going to have switches and you know the the sort of the 9300 ios xc now is becoming quite a standard now really and mm -hmm. believe it or not i've seen companies that actually use it as an access which is quite amazing you know a switch where some people will probably say it's more sort of a distribution type of switches uh, sure. the 9200 9300 catalyst so i thought to myself you know why not utilize the hardware you've already got the hardware in place so why not utilize the hardware and someone might say to me look um again an argument could be that you know um look it's you know um sort of high availability cloud or private provider. but you know if you're obviously nobody has a single switch in their company right they have multiple switches <laughs> so you, can, you could have that in a container and, and load balance it across again you know if it doesn't make Makes sense where you know for me and then this doesn't really make sense where you're going to have a one application that's utilized by a group of endpoints right within a specific location and that application that they're utilizing is somewhere down you know in another country in a data center when you could have it locally hosted or on the edge of your network and you just push it to your agent network and it's much more low latency and and that is you know one of the really good use cases i believe that could be utilized um um um, having a, a sort of running a, um, a containers on your um, on your switches um, they don't have believe it or not uh, and this was another question that came up whether they affect the performance of, of the switch itself they don't I mean majority of these run in a containerized environment so they don't actually have the, the, that, that ability now the other sort of use case as well is the ability to run not just specific you know sort of uh, bespoke applications but um run network diagnostic tools right i mean it's great right. to have wireshark right on your on your switch it, i mean it's a valuable tool and nowadays you can even get you know th there's uh, something called um i think it was a territorium where it's actually um it's, i can't remember the name i think it's a t shark but it is a terminal version of sure. wireshark so you yeah. can actually run it on the switch itself without needing any external endpoint so you can actually launch the container um and it's an it's a it's a terminal container but it's essentially wireshark right it's a containerized version of wireshark and and those you know the ability to run wireshark and and capture um uh, um, um, sort of, you know, uh, frames and, and packets. It's, it's, you know, uh, really, I, I can't really think of any words, you know, how beneficial it is to a network engineer, especially if you don't need any, you know, laptop or PC connected to where you can just do it directly from the switch itself, you know, um, um, using a console port. Um, it, it, it is, it is beneficial you don't need to open up a browser it's right there you know you just put it pop it into your console port and you can run that and i think that is one of the sort of use cases that's um not realized that you know you can run network diagnostic tools as well on your switches which is really really helpful when things you know don't go according to plan yeah. um definitely mm -hmm. and i yeah, sorry. Um, and I think the overall Linux sort of capabilities is over overlooked as well, because um, when, you know, once you sort of have a containerized version of Linux, you are, I think the biggest mistake people tend to make is that they assume this is a, a gadget or a feature, but it's not. <laughs> You're essentially turning your switch into a, a Linux box, right? It, yep. That's what it is, right? And, yep. and from that moment just think of it as a linux box and and the possibilities are endless really so yeah yeah no i, I was gonna just echo your um 
your point uh, of earlier, I just before I forget, um, I think that's essentially the art, not the argument, but the advantage of having edge networking, right? Like, is uh, you can't backhaul everything back to the cloud. Um, for example, if you think of um, your, uh, so Cisco is actually the the sponsor for, uh, you know, the 49ers for like American football 49ers stadium. Right. Yeah. And in order to provide that edge, you know, sports experience, you're not going to be able to backhaul everything back into the cloud and having that response back. You need to run something natively within the stadium. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, there's also somebody else who was, you know, and I was chatting with about edge networking. And he brought up a good point about, you know, each, if you think about it, each Tesla is actually an edge network by itself. And whenever they get that sensor coming back in to determine, you know, if that's a, a child standing in front of that car, you're not wow. going to back hold to the cloud and say, no, don't hit that car, right? <laughs> your your uh, response time should be in the sub sub milliseconds. Absolutely. So, um, so those are actual use cases where it makes sense to set, to run something natively. And if you extend that into, the the switch absolutely that you know it's beneficial with a uh, linux and a hard drive absolutely. the point you make about uh performance of course right so a lot of people don't realize where you know you have your management plan but um in order to combine those like echoes and you know process pipelines and your fibs they actually get compiled into your fib in your fpga so that yeah. that is where that you know packets being switched it's not that you know these process they don't they don't go into the linux kernel and come exactly back down and process it so yep. yeah so both of your points are super valid and i appreciate you bringing those up you know the performance as well as the um you know non non you know packet mm -hmm. switching impacting right like your uh, absolutely your is not going to be impacted no, the fibs shouldn't be in, in impacted, and you know, um, Cisco's express forwarding is in place. So you have all of these things in a data plane. I mean, um, you know, the data plane itself as a hardware should not be affected. So majority of um, the data plane operations will definitely. I would say all of them really would not be affected um, in a containerized mm -hmm. environment. And it's quite interesting that you bring that topic up, Eric, because it sort of leads me to my sort of next point. Um, recently, I've been sort of researching this topic in, in quite in depth. Um, um, and, I, and I came across, you know, what, what makes NX OS so special compared to mm -hmm. any other operating system that was developed yeah. by Cisco? I think what makes NX OS really, really interesting is the fact uh, it's that- It's an acquisition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's one part, right? That's one part, yeah, right? Let's yeah, like it wasn't built by Cisco, so it wasn't like yeah, poison. That's the elephant it. in the room. Let me just skip that one, guys. <laughs> no, but, no. You know, I'm sorry to get you off. Go for it. But, you know, it, it, it's really, it's really its ability to sort of... Um, um, they call it, I think Cisco refers to it as if you go to the Cisco developer website as yeah. open next OS, right? Mm. Um, and, and what they've seemed to have done is quite a remarkable. So they've opened up the Linux kernel, right? The Linux kernel, this is where the actual hardware um, is running on, the actual underlay that the hardware is running on, the operating system itself, right? Um, uh, they've pretty much opened that, exposed that to the user. Um, and, it, and it's quite amazing because it has direct utilization of the hardware itself, right? Um, and um, unlike, I, I'll explain in a minute about iOS XE, which is a bit different, but it, 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 it's direct, it's actually running a um, an embedded form of Linux, right? Um, mm -hmm. Especially for sort of, um, um, it's, it's yeah, essentially embedded hardware, um, right. um, Linux, um, it's called Wind, um, Wind River Linux. And yeah. I think it's mainly- It's not used... Ubuntu. <laughs> no, it's definitely not Ubuntu. No, 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 definitely not Ubuntu. <laughs> it's and, reasons, right? like yeah. Yeah. Uh, or, or Red Hat, I can assure you that. Yeah. No, so, no. So, it's, um, so it's a Wind River Linux and, and it's quite interesting because I didn't quite understand how this was the actual underlay, right? Because mm -hmm. obviously NXOS is there. Now, what I've learned was uh, a bit of time is that, um, and after sort of digging deep, I couldn't find any, like I said, it lacks quite a lot of resources, is that NXOS is actually a, a use space sort of process, right? It's actually mm -hmm. a software that's running in a user space um, where the Wind River Linux is actually the underlay hardware. So you've got two layers, right? You've got the NXOS, which has all your, you know, CLI configs, you know, the configs that all network engineers are sort of familiar with. And then you have the underlay right which is the linux hardware which is the the win linux hardware which is utilizing the the, the hardware itself right this is mm -hmm. the, which is, now uh, the, what i couldn't 
I couldn't quite understand is how they're interconnected. And I finally sort of after a lot of research made made that answer. There's a module called NetBroker module, right? Mm -hmm. And what that essentially that, that piece of um, software that is that it synchronizes those two layers. So mm -hmm. for example, when a network um, 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 so, so let me just say, so for, to give you an example, say you've got an, a, uh, an update on the on the rib on, on an NXOS um, and what the networker module does is it synchronizes that back onto the Linux kernel, right, so that they both match. So it, it synchronizes it to the lower layer. So it's like a, a synchronization module that synchronizes the conf configs on the N NXOS to the underlying Linux kernel, which is the Wind River Linux. And that is how it sort of utilizes the hardware resources. And um, it is very interesting because, like I said, it's very different. Um, they call it Bash. I think it's, it's you know, you, you, you I think it's you feature enabled Bash. But once you enable it, it's essentially, you know, they, they call it bash, but it, but it's much more than that. It's actually um, a Wind River Linux. It's not a containerized Linux um, mm -hmm. like the other forms. Um, um, it's it's uh, yeah, it's 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 a, it's, a, it's a much more sort of a full on and it has direct utilization to the hardware um, itself. Um, and then you've got, you know, the other sort of um, 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 Linux on there, which is the containerized um, um, Linux, which is what they call name as referred to as a guest shell, which I'm sure you probably know about. Right. Um, and that is IOX is what, what, what I think they name it, which stands for iOS mm -hmm. Linux. Now, what essentially that guest shell is, it's a containerized form of, of Linux. Right. And. And those of you who doesn't know what container is, essentially a self-sufficient application that has all of its dependencies to run in a sort of a in its in in in, in any environment. Um, and um, this um, Linux, the Linux that the containers run is CentOS. Um, a different depending on what version of the hardware um, or, um, iOS you're using, it could be seven, it could be eight. Um, but you could upgrade this, right? But mm -hmm. what's quite interesting is through both of these, right? They have full package management utilities you know such as yum you know and and a lot of people don't think it's like okay wait a second if i have package utility management um and if i essentially have you know a full linux kernel could i run ansible on this yes you can you can run an ansible you know yeah, yeah, light yeah, just yeah, right, yeah exactly <laughs> right you, you can wait a second could i run Net Nico module, if I can get a module inside Python using pip install, yes, you can. I've done it. it you can run Net Nico on it without any issues, right? Yeah. Um, um, you can run, can you run Terraform? Absolutely. You can download the Terraform ARM64 version of Terraform. I've tried it. It works. It's great. I mean, can you imagine having all of those utilities within an, your Unbox environment? And I think that is just amazing. Now, one of those well, you don't have to imagine taha just did it for you <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. You show you those examples and, you, know, you know it, it's just solved. absolutely it's it's really really amazing um that you're able to do and i think one of the things that i came up against was is that if i let's just assume that i'm in a sort of an air gapped environment mm -hmm. where it's completely in, almost impossible, right, to right. get anything into that environment. Even you know, um, attaching a a, 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 um, um, a laptop that has Python and all the modules installed and all the goodies installed, right? You know, because let's be honest, you know, if you haven't got the request module and it doesn't come native with Python, and if you haven't got <laughs> you know a good, let's say, um, an SSH module like Paramico, you're sort of limited in right. what you can do, right? In terms of yeah. in terms of automated network devices, right. right? You're very limited actually, yeah. and it doesn't, you know, the Python that it has, I think. It's 3.7 i can't remember but it didn't have it doesn't have any it doesn't have the request module so you can't do any api actions yeah um um and um, because those aren't native to to the, not the standard Python. library yeah exactly 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 so and it didn't have you know parameter or any of it. so things were very difficult right and this is the challenge that i face so for example i've got a 100 access switches right and on my core i've got one good nexus switch um and i've also got some good ios xc 9 to what what can i do um, or what could you do, you know, in order, let's say we need to create VLANs across all of those access switches. How can we automate that process? Right. And at the same time, you know, we've got a complete air gap system. We can't do anything, but how can we automate, put ourselves in a position where we can automate all of those repetitive um, 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 sort of um, toil tasks without 
you know, attaching any sort of a third party device, you know, what can we do? Um, and I think um, that is something that's interesting that I'm working on at the moment, mm -hmm. um, because it is very difficult, as you probably know, to do with anything with Python, especially when you're dealing with switches that are networked and you don't have any SSH modules and you've got the standard library. Um, good luck to anybody who wants to create a, a, an SSH module from scratch, <laughs> because, <laughs> because you're in a world of pain, you know, you're right. in a world of pain. You're in a world of pain. Right? Uh, Kirk Beyer to <laughs> to, yeah, to exactly. the side and like, I, I bet even Kirk couldn't rewrite the whole thing within like an hour, right? Even though he's the creator. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I, so I, that's, I, that's the challenges that I'm facing at the moment. And I'm hopefully hope, hoping that I can overcome those. Yeah, no, I, I like the point you brought up about um, like namespaces, right? Like the, the fact that uh, native Linux uh, with access to hardware shouldn't be overlooked because um yeah so like you know maybe people are not familiar too familiar with like namespacing is you know it's an expensive operation to copy a uh, a packet or whatever from like one one memory space to another and especially if you have um like linux who's the the, the latest kernels and you know free kernels before that have a very very clear delimitation between you know your your kernel namespace versus your your other namespaces where like moving around is, is very difficult and that's expensive operation which is why the the process is so slow and something like dpdk or in this case like nxos we're able to you know kind of bridge the two where you know you just have to you don't have to copy it between namespaces exactly. you just have it in one place and then you you get that performance and like you said they also have like a, a guest shell where you know, it's, it's just regular uh, CentOS that, you know, that's you're it. all familiar with. Yeah, no, that's it. That, that's it. You know, and I think what the, the other aspect that, that's quite scary as well that I have personally found during my research is that with, with, when, with the containerized version of Linux, um, it, it, you've got to remember it's a container, right? It has no understanding of the current infrastructure that it's in, whether it's in a switch, whether it's in a, it's a, it's right. a running in a PC. It, it doesn't know that, right? It's a containerized. So one of the great difficulties that many people have with this is the ability, how do I root? this to the hardware you know how do i attach this with, with the actual interfaces right i've i've got the the the, uh, the, the linux um, container running um center west but how do i route it outside of my network how do i make sure that that container is able to reach all my network devices so i can automate and i think th th those are the things that are sort of scaring people and th there's there's many ways you can do this you can use things like virtual port groups and attach the container to the virtual port group and then associate and then that way you will have the sort of agency with the with, it's, it's a virtual port group essentially an svi right it's a virtual um, um a, a virtual interface and associate that with a physical interface so you'll essentially have to root that container as well of that outside of the, the the box itself and i think that may be quite scary but with the nxos remember the bash shell it's it's directly utilizing the hardware it's not in a containerized form so you don't need to do all those all that routing and so forth you can directly you know perform your automation you could let's say um um, um you know if you've got the right modules you could you know go ahead let's say um automate you know um, the creation of let's say vlan 20 in 100 switches with ease without using any other pc um, just by using that box itself you know it's got all the utilities that you need in there for for example it's got vim it's, it has everything um, as an editor so you could essentially create a small script python script um, and it does a lot of interesting things as well because there's a an interesting module that it has on there which is a cli module um, which essentially allows it to interact with the actual underlying um, 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 NXOS um, um, CLI. So, yeah, it, it, it is very, very interesting. And I think it's a, it's a topic maybe not marketed. I, I personally believe because I think it's, you shouldn't just assume it's just for an application hosting um, platform. It's much more than that. I would say the some of the features of these sort of, uh, of these switches, especially the newer models are, are amazing. I mean, they're, they're absolutely amazing, really. Yeah, mm, yeah I mean, yeah, I mean, it's hard to convey. I think the the overall picture, right? Like, or how, like, to just tell that all the awesomeness of <laughs> of the setup would be. Yeah. But I think it's safe to say that it is a way to uh, give you all the tools that you're familiar with, without a lot of uh, external dependencies, right? Absolutely. Like, you're, you're ab absolutely 100%. able to just do a lot of the things that you're so used to. 
as opposed to, you know, maybe uh, I remember a long time ago when I was, you know, trying to automate something and all I had available was a tickle shell, right? In iOS. <laughs> and then you have to like change your contacts. You have to learn tickle syntax. It wasn't hard, but it was nonetheless another thing that you have to learn and have to do. But now that you have these on box for all of, you know, NXOS, XR, SE, then uh, you're able to just transfer that knowledge without contact switching. Would that be like kind of a correct statement? Absolutely, 100%. I, I mean, I couldn't have said it any better, actually. Um, I, I, and I think, you know, you, you've, you've really hit the nail on the head. You've got all the tools that you need, in, especially from a network automation point of view, things that we know, all the tools that we need, you know, from Python, you know, um, containers, we have everything that we need, really. On, on these boxes and it's like and and also you've got to remember as well that everything that's in the box from a security point of view you are not attaching any external point in, endpoints onto that network um, right so yeah so you've also got that got that security reassurance as well that no now that you've connected that laptop to your network you know what you don't know what's what's what went in or what what was in your laptop right um, <laughs> and you know you've got everything you know you've got all the utilities in, on your um, on your pc so if if you've got a let's say you know a clean um, um, sort of image laptop that doesn't have anything in there, you know, you could connect the console port up and then you will realize that uh, uh, that you've got pretty much everything in there, you know, from the moment that you enable guest shell, yeah. um, the moment that you expose you, the, the bash shell itself, um, um, Python, it has many type of, it's, it's, it's quite strange actually, because it has a lot to free, I think free forms of Python, but a lot of people don't know about that, you know. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just it's, Python, it's not like it, iOS it, Python, it's it, not it, like Cisco no, Python. It, it, yeah. so, so, you know, so one of the Python, so the native Pythons that run on these boxes, right, yeah. native, they have a native Python. Sure. Um, and, and so the, for example, the one on NXOS actually has got modules, which is quite unique, um, yeah. that, that, that are made by Cisco. So it has a module called named Cisco actually, there's yeah. a and there's a module called CLI, which is essentially allows it to utilize the underlying hardware system. So it yeah. allows you to write Python scripts utilizing the underlay hardware system um, um, uh, with that with that module. And it's doing it via API from what I recall from my research. So yeah, yeah it has quite unique libraries, the, the native Python, but within the container itself, within CentOS, right. it has you know, you Python, the Python that me and you know about, right? right. It has, it, right? It doesn't have those special modules that, that that were developed by Cisco. So, so it is quite interesting. So you've got, you're absolutely right. You've got quite a lot of tools, really. Um, pretty much, I would say all the tools that you need in order to automate your infrastructure, whether that's you know expanding your layer two domain, um, you know, creating that VX. It's it has everything. It, it really does have everything that you need. Uh, I think. Right. I would say. Let, let me take that back. So you do have that special. Cisco Python <laughs> or yeah, like exactly. Python with, uh, you know, Cisco module and then still like, yeah, 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 all yeah. those goodies. But if you, if you, you know, uh, feel like it, you could have the regular Python as well. Right. You know, exactly. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Ty, it's, it's, it's great that you brought these up. I, I really enjoy our conversation. Um, but I mean, you're so far advanced, right? Like, so how, let me, let me ask for the rest of us, right? Like we're not familiar with it. We don't, we haven't done extensive research. How can we get started with playing around with these, you know, these cool containers in uh, iOS? Yeah, I, I think um, w one of the um, things that I recommend is I, I've no, you will, I will, I've noticed about a lot of switches. Whenever I sort of see an iOS XC switch, I yeah. realize that the guest container shell has never been turned on right uh, <laughs> they probably don't know about it right i mean and 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 a lot of people don't even know you even have you know python in the old sort of iox um, xc devices like the free three six five zeros you know you've got the, 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 there's python too on there and i think a lot of people maybe are not aware of how to turn these on and the containers on so turning the containers on um and you know a uh, going into uh, bash you know just it's, it's very easy you know especially with the nxos it's just you know feature bash shell and it will turn the bash um, and that just exposes the underlying sort of um, hardware and then you've got your linux kernel that you can play with and the moment i think you've got to think of it like this and i think it took me a while to get my head around this and i think this is probably the key do not think of that um, um nxos or or iOS XC device, you know, even if it's, you know, your CSR um, um, routers, you know, your virtualized CSR routers, do not think of them as just as a network device, but think of them as a Linux 
operating system, right? Right. Yeah. Think of it as a Linux. And, and and from that moment, think of it that you've got Ubuntu ready. I know it's, it's quite far-fetched, but it's not really because you've got all the um, 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 package manage, management utilities on there like Yum and, and so forth. So think of it as that way. The moment you think of, of it that you can, you know, um, download packages, download software, Ansible, anything on there, then you realize that, hey, I'm this is not a switch you know I'm sitting in front of my Linux box right it's it's, it's yeah. it, it is a, so I think that's that is one way you can get started just enabling those tools and play around with it as is as if you're sitting in front of a Linux box not necessarily a switch that is one thing that I found quite easy and then you realize that creativity there's so many things that you could do from running uh, containers docker I mean docker is actually built into it um, you could run a Kubernetes cluster if you wanted to you know have a bunch of containers in in, in, in pods um, um, so there's so many things you could do. Um, there's a book um, by Cisco, which I highly recommend. And I will, maybe you can, um, it's called- Yeah, I already put it in the show notes because I saw you. Um, is it the containers in Cisco iOS? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Oh. That is a great, great book. Um, um, I can never pronounce the the the, the author's, uh, the, one of the author's name, but he is absolutely <laughs> fantastic book. I mean, I, you know, these guys are absolutely amazing. Honestly, it's, it's a genius of a book. And, and I think maybe the title itself doesn't maybe do justice because it's assumed that it's just about containers it is not mm. i can assure you they talk about everything you know how to get you know um how to ssh into the you know into into the um into the bash um kernel as opposed to ssh into the switch i mean a lot of complex topics that are discussed in that book which i thought wow i, I can't believe you know not many people have know about this book right no no yeah. it's it's an amazing book and i think it, once you sort of go through that book then you can come up with a lot of creative different ways um to play around with 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 um with open uh, nxos and also linux as well because it's, it's it, th those are the key things it's, the key i would say is is understanding linux and uh, learning linux because once you fully grasp it and you know how to manage linux then you realize that hey I can run anything on these 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 switches, you know. Yeah, I, I get excited just hearing about it. You're now the master of your own domain, right? Like you, <laughs> you no longer need to add any external tools. You don't need to rely on this wall garden provided by you. You have those open source tools, and yeah, the book. I mean, I didn't know about the book until you posted. So thank you so much for doing that. I have it already in the show notes. It's called Containers in Cisco iOS XE, iOS XR, and NSOS Orchestration Operation by Yogesh and Najendra, like you said, I probably, you know, I, my apology if I, you know, what's the name, but like you said, it's brilliant. I haven't read it, but I, I glanced through it. Just the fact that they talk so deeply about NXOS, like a near real time OS kernel and all of that. That's amazing. It is. And uh, I, I appreciate your, you talk about, you know, how turn it on, like you heard it here first, turn it on change your mindset and be the king of your domain <laughs> absolutely absolutely 100 percent. and and you will realize that you will no longer need you know uh, an external sort of endpoint to right. have your automations you can have everything done within the network itself and it's um you know before you know it you're going to create your own sort of python scripts um that are running on the on your um you know interfaces you know whether you're trying to capture a specific data or yeah. trying to diagnose tools it's it's the possibilities are, are really endless really and if you play doom please send me pictures <laughs> <laughs> send me a top no, pictures no, like no, you know, play any kind of games um, <laughs> Maybe please. just pass us, right? Like don't, <laughs> don't pass it out so your boss don't see it. But please, please just send us pictures. Yeah, um, please. <laughs> Ty, please do not listen to Eric because that's that's it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't tell you. You're gonna, gonna, you're gonna, gonna be doing your, you're, you're gonna be need to change up your CV quite quickly after that. Yeah, yeah. Do, not, do it, yeah, do it yeah, in, your, in your lab box, and uh, you didn't hear from us, right? Like I'm just saying. Um, yeah, so Todd, um, it, it's been a pleasure. I really enjoy our conversation. Uh, the honor is all mine to have you on the show. Thank you for making the time. If people want to, you know, know more about your thoughts, want to follow you on uh, on Twitter, on social, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, I, I mean, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. I'm also on. Um, I've got my own website, um, networkautomator.com. Okay. Um, and uh, all the YouTube content. I've also sort of resorted to YouTube content because I find it easy sometimes yep. uh, to express myself verbally as opposed to having it written. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, YouTube, um, um, Twitter, as well as um, networkautomator.com. Um, feel free to reach out. Um, you know, if there's anything that you need or any sort of um, any topic that you, you you don't quite understand what we've discussed today, please 
please feel free to reach out and I will try my best to, to assist you really. Oh my God, be careful what you ask for. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to be like you know, unicasting you and like, what is this Linux life cycle thing you talked about? But um, I appreciate you. I mean, it, it's been a great conversation. I, I really enjoyed Absolutely. it. Thank you. No, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I, you know, you're, you're one of my inspirations, um, Eric. And uh, yeah, keep doing what you do because uh, you do a very amazing job. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for the kind words. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Network Animation Nerds Podcast today. Find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and all the other podcast platforms. Until next time, bye-bye.